Uh, Keith, how did uh, how did the practice a couple the last couple of days go? And do you see yourself making a whole lot of changes or just some little changes prior to the game tomorrow night? We're not going to make a lot of changes. We're just trying to get better in every aspect that we feel like we have issues with. Um, I think that would be irresponsible to you know to just kind of knock the whole house down and uh, and and start over with you know, new things and different things. We're close to winning. We just have to play a little better. Coach, um, get my camera going here. Uh, what, what do you think you guys are as far as fitness levels when it comes to playing a guy? I know a couple weeks ago, you were saying you're about two weeks away. Where are you guys now kind of getting back healthy and getting back right? We're better fitness level wise, but we're not, we're probably preseason fitness level. You know what I mean? Like pre A10 fitness level, first three, four, or five games of the season type of deal. That's kind of how I see it. I don't know for sure, but that's just my gut, uh, my gut feeling. And then from a technical perspective, where are you guys now as far as like shots? I know sometimes like it look a little flat. Is that still kind of a thing with ties and fitness as well? Well, I think I think uh, that that's a really good question in that in that. Uh, uh, from my experience, it's the reason usually freshmen don't shoot the ball particularly well their first year because they're, they're not used to having to defend so hard, which takes a lot of their legs and their fitness, and they're used to resting on defense and being able to save things for offense. So when you play a lot of freshmen, generally you don't shoot the ball particularly well. And, uh, and then on top of it, our older guys, you know, their fitness level has been hurt as well. So I'm sure that that leads to part of it. And then part of it is moving the ball, shot selection, uh, technical ability, screening, passing, cutting, you know, all of that plays into it. And then the, the last part is, and uh, no excuses, but the other guy averaged six assists a game or five and a half assists a game you know, that you're immediately taking out of your lineup. And Don Martin, who's a secondary assist guy, now becomes your primary assist guy. So it hurts you. Like, it's it's kind of like learning to walk again in some regards. Do you see you uh, using Tyson more often and pairing him up with Tavian, putting Tavian in more of a shooting position going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, the the thing that Tyson's shown is he's he's been, uh, to this point, he's been uh, – uh, he's taking good care of the basketball. He's tried to do the right things. You know, we actually need him to score more. Like you, you can't play a guy 30 minutes if they only score two points at those positions. You understand like those, it's not like the old days where a point guard was just straight distributor. It's more like when Isaiah Thomas was a point guard. I mean, the old Isaiah Thomas, not the new Isaiah Thomas. You know, he kind of was the first scoring point guard. So nowadays, if you don't score at the one, two, and the three, it becomes difficult to score because those guys are your best scorers generally. Keith, how nice was it to have Maceo back at practice over the last couple of days? Well, it was nice for me because I like Maceo. And, uh, you know, our, our ultimate job as a coach is to not only win games, but to make sure we take care of our people through good, bad, and ugly and through tough times and uh, – Ultimately, if you don't do that, then you're really not worth your salt as a coach. Should we expect to see him on Wednesday? Will we see him in the game? Uh, I would tend to say no. I don't really want to rush it. I want to make sure that he's in the right mental framework, uh, that he's ready to go, that it's the right thing for him. And if that means all season, it means all season. I really don't care at that at that point. I, I have to do I have to do him right and make sure that he's in a, in the right frame of mind, but he looks like he's getting better to me. Uh, I've seen smiles on his face in practice. He's practiced at a high level, and uh, I'm just happy for that step right now. Coach, how are, how are you feeling lately? I remember the last couple of times, you, you're, you're a little bit fatigued there, man. You seem a little bit more rested today. Uh, you know, look, I've been down and out and really never should have coached again, you know, so – I've been at worse places than this, you know, as far as where we're at right now. And I've had to fight for everything I've gotten my whole life. You know, I'm the worst player in my family. 
I got all my mom's genes. The rest of them all got really good athletic genes. So I've had to fight for, for what I've gotten. And so I'm not a, I'm not a guy that's not, not going to punch back. And, uh, you know, I believe in myself. I believe in our staff. I believe in our players. So look at, I, I just have to fight. And Hey, I've told our players this too. Like you got to take the good with the bad sometimes, right? Like you got to take the bad sometimes, like in order to, in order to get to the next spot, sometimes you have to take a step back. And if, if you can't, if you can't battle back, then, then you're in trouble. Like, uh, and I'm not talking basketball, right? We've all been there. So there's far worse things than losing basketball games. And I don't like it because I get paid to win games, but, but I'm ready for the fight. Thanks for telling me I look a little better, too. That must have looked pretty bad. <laughs> hey, we're all getting through it, man. Pandemic. What you were talking about before, Keith, with the, um, you know, the stamina and the, uh, you know, the way you guys are in shape, the conditioning and so forth, is that especially important in this game against URI since they appear to be pretty good coming out of halftime? They seem to be, they seem to be a team that gets better in the second half of games. You guys have to – particularly monitor that in this contest? So the way I view Rhode Island is one, they played 14 games. They've been fortunate enough to stay away from the virus and have played 14 games. And you're talking about, about a bunch of high major transfers. So you're talking about high level talent. They, they have a new team, but they have high level talent. So they're capable of beating anybody in our league on any given night. And if you don't believe that, ask VCU at VCU, right? They're, they're as good as any team on our, in our league on any given night. With that being said, they've been a little streaky and uh, in games against us even. Like, you know, the first year when they were in the top 20 in the country, we go there and we, we go to the last possession and they, they hit a three to beat us, right? Uh, the next year, we play in here and we're down 19 in the second half when we come back to win, right? And then last year, we play a really good first half. We're up about eight or 10. And then at halftime, it's about a two point game. And then they beat our brains in in the second half. So with them, you don't, it's like, you know, you don't know totally what, how they're going to be. When they get it rolling, man, they're like the Harlem Globetrotters. But then there's other times where they, they don't play great, but they're capable of, of beating anybody in their team you don't want to play in the tournament. That Mitchell kid sort of uh, filling the void for Langevin? He's played well. He's played well, but Antoine Walker's played well at the four spot, and they played him at the five more last year. And then, you know, it starts with Fats. You got to do a great job with Fats, and they kind of uh, – they kind of got the uh, the other guard that kind of took Doughton's spot, uh, Jeremy Shepard, who's a, a good transfer. He, he plays very much like Doughton. So they've got good depth. They've got good players. You know, they've got uh, Kerry, who transferred from Syracuse. They've got a lot of good players. I mean, we just have to – we have to win as a team. That's how we have to beat them. Keith, how do you feel things have gone from the defensive aspect, understanding the importance of defense now and just getting better in that craft? Well, I think the last four games we've uh, we on average we've held people to about thirty eight percent. I think thirty seven, thirty eight percent, which you should be at least three and one when you do that. But we we're, we're one and three, so you know we've done a good job at the defensive end. I think we can get better. I think we we will get better. Uh, I'm just scared to death what happens if we don't play good defense one night because you know you have those nights and then if you don't play good defense one night with what, what has happened to us. But I think we'll play better offensively as well. We just got to relax. We've got to relax and just move the ball and not let things bother us, really. Keith, you guys got one game to make up. Is that right, Richmond? What's that now? You have one game to make up, Rich, Richmond? Uh, we have St. Louis as well. Two of them, that's right. So any, any word on see what happens with that. You haven't heard any word on when those games might be made up? I haven't. Keith, how's uh, Mikey Bacalia coming along? I know you talked about him having a stress fracture. He's got some minutes, uh, and before he was injured, you mentioned him and his ability to run the point. Uh, are we going to see him getting more minutes here over the next couple games? I like Mikey. I really do. I thought, you know, in the 16 minutes he played against Greensboro, he played well. He's very solid. He's really good defensively. 
He moves the ball well. Uh, he doesn't look like, you know, all that in a bag of chips, but he he's pretty good, solid player, you know. And again, like if he if he can make shots, which you know we don't know yet as a freshman, he's got a good stroke. Then he'll be a guy that can help us because he won't mistake you to death. He's not going to make many mistakes. He's a tough kid. Hey Keith, you mentioned earlier about you know missing sincere carry as it relates to you know ball distribution, especially on offense. I'm sure the answer to this question is you're, you're missing it on both. But defensively, uh, do you miss it just as much, if not more, from what you've seen so far? Or how do you think you're handling the loss of him on D, especially when it comes to matching up against some of the other top-notch ball handlers that you face so far, Lofton maybe in particular? Well, when Sincere wants to, he can guard anybody in the country. He's one of the premier defenders in the country when he wants to when he really wants to put emphasis on that side of the ball. And that's one of the things we talked to him about was really building his whole game on that side of the ball. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, he can guard one through three because he's strong as an ox. You know, he's really good on the ball, but he's also his knowledge off the ball is high level. So, yeah, we took a hit on both sides. I mean, again, like, again, in fairness to our guys, there's very few teams in this league or any league in the country that can lose three starters and not take a hit. Like, I mean, you have to be realistic with yourself. I mean, you're talking about a hundred games started or something like that. Like nobody can withstand that and nobody can withstand losing arguably one of their best players. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's not an easy deal, but we don't, nobody cares. Like, you know, nobody, nobody's going to say, Oh, well, or, Oh, well, you know, we got to give them a pass. I mean, we, we got to figure out ways to win with, without, you know, that's the way, that's the way I see it. Keith, uh, the TV announcers uh, Friday night uh, made it sound like you're going to be in the uh, new place by February. Have you heard anything in that regard? Um, I've heard it. <laughs> I mean, but again, I can't control any of that. So I'm still camping. I'm going to keep camping until it's time to get over there. And by camping, I mean, I'm still in this office. I'm still in the rec center and it's fine, man. That's, that's, that's the cards we were dealt. We don't have any choice. So look, we were good enough to be in the rec center, win 21 games last year and 11 in the league. So it is what it is. We just got to keep battling, but I haven't heard anything, Jerry. And I don't ask really. I, if you ask, then you get disappointed when you don't, when you're not in there, when you think you're supposed to be there. This way, I don't have to get disappointed. Anything else? Hey, did you, uh, are you gonna explain to Noah and Zach who the uh, Harlem Go Charters are since they're kind of young there? <laughs> Excuse me, I've watched their games. One of the players went to hack, Handles Franklin. So uh, no, I, I know darn well. <laughs> hey, Zach, so do you really know about the Globe Trotters though? The history? Yeah, sure. You know the beginning teams of the Globetrotters? Tell me about the beginning teams. I mean, not that far back history, but I mean, now that we're putting the pressure on me, I mean, new bias is making me want to meet my mic right now, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so here's How the far are you going? Metal like Lemon Coach? Where, where are you going? No, so we'll here, here's the deal. So so my uncle was a, was a first team All-American in 1950, right? And he was a number one draft pick of the Knicks in 1950. And back then, uh, they had a college all-star team that used to play against the Globetrotters, who were the best African-American players in the country. You know, because back then, Chuck Cooper was the first African-American to play in the NBA, so there weren't a lot of African-Americans in the NBA. So the Globetrotters were the best players in the world, right? And the college all-stars played the Globetrotters. And you're talking about, like, Goose Tatum and guys like that, right? So kind of like the, the Negro Leagues in baseball, right? You know, the greatest players were playing in the Negro Leagues back then. So my point is, is what the Globetrotters are now, that's not how it used to be, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We're talking about some great, great, great players. And so, you know, with ML King Day yesterday, it's just good to continue to work on our African-American history, right? I think that's an important, important deal. We watched film yesterday, actually, of one of uh, uh, Dr. King's speech and discussed it and talked about it. Because again, like 
this is important stuff, what's going on in our country. And that's our obligation to educate not only our players, but educate the general public as well. A couple of Pittsburgh ties in the Globe Trotters. Yeah, fire away. You can help me. You're educating me. See, there you go. Antigua, Orlando Antigua was a uh, Globe Trotter. Their play by play guy is a Globe Trotter. Uh, was Connie Hawkins a Globe Trotter at some point or not? Connie Hawkins. Uh, yep. Connie was, yeah. I had a player at Akron that was a Globe Trotter. So, I mean, it's. It's I mean, Wilt, Wilt was a trotter for a couple of days. I mean, you really get into some very interesting guys who uh, played for those trotter teams when they were rolling. And Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain also was a professional volleyball player that people don't know. Like, so unbelievable athlete. Like, when are you writing was, your book? What's that? When are you writing your book? Well, I could write one, Jerry. Damn. <laughs> I'm gonna wait till I retire. I'm gonna wait till I retire for all that, though, right? I'm just trying to win as many ball games as I can right now. Is that a leadership book or a life book? I could probably do both. I mean, um, you know, as you know, I have a, more of that business background. But look, at, I, I've just so you know, I've, I'm viewing this as the ultimate challenge. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna really give it everything I have and make this the ultimate challenge for us and our team and for me personally. And I'm going to give it everything I have. So uh, I'm not, a, I'm look at, I got hit with 18 pitches in one year. So I just got hit with five in one week. So I'm going to keep coming back. As long as they don't hit me in the head and knock me silly, I'll be all right. 